Hello and welcome to Access Studio. My name is Nancy Gesimondo. I'm in Long Island City this afternoon, an area with one of the highest concentrations of artist studios in New York City. I won't be meeting with one particular artist in their studio today. Instead, I invited a group of artists to share their work with you. In this episode, I'll be presenting the second segment of Under Construction, a group exhibition I curated before the pandemic broke out. Under Construction examines the work of 15 artists who were compelled to find inspiration amidst rapidly changing urban landscapes. These neighborhood enclaves, once home to particular groups of people, manufacturing industries and warehouses have been raised and replaced by high-rise luxury condominiums with such an imposing presence that they completely transform one's sense of place. In this collection of work, we are confronted with how one comes to terms with remodeling the idea of home in dense urban environments, whether lamenting a lost view or embracing a new one. Perhaps as a way of holding on to part of the past, some of these artists have created sculptures and assemblages with salvaged remnants from demolished buildings and discarded construction materials. Others provide historical preservation through photography and painting, conveying an inherent nostalgia or a sense of wonder at the making of these massive buildings and structures. We noticed one day that they were doing surveying in the parking lot and discovered that they were going to put up a building which is happening all over the neighborhood. And I thought, I'm leaving. I can't stay here. This view, this open view is so important to me, this view of the sky and the changing weather. And this informs my work so much that I'm going to just go. And then I thought, no, I think I'll stay. I'm actually going to stay with a determination to experience the transformation. I started to draw the construction process. And then at a certain point, the floors began to arrive. And I really was fascinated by the variety of pattern and color in the materials they were using, in the clothes they were wearing, and then the movement of these workers around the space. I felt rather godlike on my 13th floor. I'm leaning out, I'm drawing on my cup, I'm making little videos, I'm holding it in my hand, and the construction is way down below. There was a hiatus, there was a stop work order for a couple of months, and somehow we felt hopeful in the building that the inevitable might not happen, but then they sorted out their issues and resumed work. And when they resumed work, they were full steam ahead, double the number of people. I just felt that incredible energy. As they came up closer and closer, I had to move to bigger pages. I could no longer contain it on the cup. It was no longer something I could hold in my hands. And then in December, they arrived. It was like theater. It was like being in the front row of a Broadway theater, scaffolding up, nets up, arc lights shining into the building, looking through the netting, in orange and purple and blue contrasting light, neon yellow safety jackets, white hard hats. I would come in at dawn just to watch the sun come up and hit the construction site from the side and illuminate the stage. I was awestruck by how extraordinarily beautiful that was. I am Robert Loeb, a photographer and painter living in Astoria, Queens. I've long been interested in the photographic possibilities of construction sites in New York City. The photographs of mine in under construction were taken in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and the Lower East Side of Manhattan when those areas were undergoing gentrification. 
In my color photographs, I'm not interested in documenting a construction site. Instead, I am looking for compelling details, which I can extract from their context and represent as fine art photographs. There is an offhand beauty and a powerful expressiveness to be discovered at these sites. Compositions suggest themselves from the rhythm of colors and shapes, the gestural expression of graffiti and paint, surface textures, and the changing qualities of light. Sometimes these construction sites remain inactive over the course of months, even years. These are the sites which are most interesting to me. They contain what can be called seasoned surfaces that reflect the passage of time. Passers-by write graffiti, splash paint, affix posters with images. It all gets very interesting, a veritable feast for the eyes. Construction sites are curious, in between places, with a temporary existence between something old and something new. They are uncomfortable places, too, and for several reasons. We are not meant to linger there. We don't want to be caught trespassing, especially in our tense times. There are the dangers of unsteady footing and heavy objects which could shift or topple. Often these construction sites are locked and secured. On occasion, the builders do allow us a glimpse into the proceedings by cutting out small windows in the walls. We can then see the scope of the project and the progress being made. And this suggests another source of a discomfort. Is this really progress we're looking at? What has been torn up and made to disappear in order for these major projects to proceed? What's been the impact on people's homes, livelihoods, even health? Is something unique and full of character being replaced with something soulless? It is complicated, but I know that when finally there's a new, pristine building in place, I will need to take my photography elsewhere. My name is Mary Pinto. I used to take the 7 train every day to work, often traveling through Queensboro Plaza. During my morning and evening commutes, I started to see a lot of tall buildings going up. Every day, it seemed, there was a new one. I began to shoot videos on my cell phone from the train as a way to notice what was new and remember what used to be there. I wondered who would be living or working in these luxury properties I saw under construction and how these dramatic changes would affect the surrounding neighborhoods, including my own. At the same time, I looked forward to capturing a new layer of floors and scaffolding going up the construction workers moving about the site, and the reflection of the changing sky and the train itself as seen in the glass towers. I was curious about the changes I saw in the Sunnyside rail yards with Manhattan in the distance. I live in Queens and have my studio at home. I am a photographer working with alternative processes, photograms, and collage. Nature is my usual subject matter, either on its own or in relation to the built environment. In addition to the many videos I've made of the construction and changing landscape along the 7 train line, I've also made this series of collages. From my home and studio, I see these new buildings from a distance as they shoot up on the horizon, so that scale is reflected in these pieces. Most of them are small, between 8 by 6 inches and 8 by 12 inches, in contrast to the impressive size of the structures in reality. My source materials are photograms I make of plants and flowers from my garden, as well as photograms of pages from the New York Times, often from the financial, real estate, or home sections of the paper. I use pen and mixed media to complete the collages.
My name is Katha Cato, and this is my piece, and it is called Shredded. It's 41 and a half by 26, and the metal pieces actually come out and clear the wall by about uh, 10 inches. And I'm just kind of giving it a little cleanup a little bit because it's got a little dust here and there. And I really didn't know if I wanted to do that because it's been on the wall for a while, and it had a lot of dust on it. And I thought, well, maybe it's just continuing to create as an art because these are pieces that would normally be discarded. Um, they're all found. This is a, a, an old cheese grater, and these are nails that I found disintegrating in a box on the street. These are my dad's rasps when he was cleaning out one of his tool chests, and this is a bed spring. And I like to work with these kinds of items because they're really the workhorses and the unsung heroes of everything that we're sitting on and everything that I grew up around. And the bed springs were the unsung heroes of a bed where lives were lived. And, you know, maybe babies were made, maybe horrible arguments happened, you know, maybe somebody, maybe somebody passed away in that bed and then the bed was no longer useful. Um, but to me, the springs now come forth and have their own life and contribute to something new. And I know that this is the heat in the heart, and I don't know if everything is coming down into it and being shredded into something new, or if it's all being sucked up and shredded into something that is going to go out into the universe. But this is my piece called Shredded. This is my piece called the Exploding Toolbox. It's on a pretty beat up piece of plywood. It's 49 by 49. And some of the pieces are wired so they extend out into the room about 18 to 19 inches. The whole concept behind this is that at one time all of these things fit so nice and neatly in his tool chest. Uh, and this imaginary handyman, he drops the toolbox and it falls down and I've captured it in a moment in time. And, been able to with wires and nails and been able to kind of keep them all connected with a great deal of tension in between them. So you, you almost feel that you're, you've stuck in a moment of time of the trajectory and you feel the tension of the stuff wanting to continue to fly out. Um, but it's all very intricately wired together so that things are in these odd shapes and odd relationship with each other. My favorite piece is the girly picture that's up there in the right hand corner. You know, the tool guys that I, I grew up with in their shops and in their trucks, they had girly pictures. And I always thought it was so odd that such a feminine, beautiful figure would be amongst all the oil and nails and the saws and the rasps but I guess that makes the world go around. I'm Jim Seffens, and uh, it was the gentrification of the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood that led to the displacement of my previous studio after more than three decades in the same side street storefront. Upon finding a new affordable space in Long Island City in 2011, I was happy to discover that my new space was in an area that was both zoned industrial and was height limited, which would seem to make new construction less likely. The three paintings shown here are all based on the views along one block of Long Island City's 11th Street as it appeared in 2011. Contrast to today, there are small but significant changes taking place all around the studio building, as well as changes within. The turnover of small businesses and artists that have space in this building has been such that 10 years on, mine would be one of the longest tenancies. While the building that housed Aunt Rosie's still stands, it seems that Rosie and Jimmy's kids had no interest in taking over the family business. 
It is now called Niforis Diner with new signage and a new paint job. Adjacent to the diner, an old three-story clapboard building has been gutted and renovated into apartments with an impressive solar array on the roof. The old uniform store on that block has been replaced by a microbrewery, and the appliance warehouse is currently being gutted and reconfigured for commercial or retail space. The view from 11th Street down 43rd Avenue has changed somewhat. The low gray building toward the center of the painting served as the first floor for new construction that rises four stories. New development on Roosevelt Island also crowds into the view of the bridge. It is the view that I did not capture that has changed the most. Looking east from the studio building, I now see a dozen or more towers that have risen in the past decade. And while the site can be appreciated as an entirely new modern city, it also seems ominous in the sense that I must wonder how much longer my little corner of Long Island City will provide suitable space for my work. I am Michelle Chaikin, and this work is from my series called Queen's Surface. I started photographing the Borough of Queens in 2003, a few years after moving to Astoria. I was struck by how the borough was illuminated by light as it was unobstructed by the tall buildings of Manhattan. Also how the area seems like a forgotten place. I knew it was right for development, especially in Long Island City. I was driven to photograph, so I set out with my Pentax 67, a medium format camera where I use color negative film to capture the light, color, and textures. I traveled to different neighborhoods and explored. I explored Willits Point. I explored Jamaica. I explored Elmhurst. In 2013, I selected 40 photographs to be exhibited at the Flushing branch of the Queens Public Library. I also had exhibited at the Queens Borough Hall the same year. Representing 10 years of photographing different neighborhoods of Queens, I plan to publish Queen Surface as a book. Queen Surface being the bus line that used to run through Queens. And now we can see so much has changed. In Long Island City, there are now tall buildings, hotels where I once photographed, and there were just a couple story houses and buildings. In Queens, we can see the effects of gentrification as generic architecture and chain stores replace artist spaces like Five Points. Rent increases push out working families from their homes. And Queens, known as the most international borough, gets more and more inhabited by Caucasians. Yet this all can be seen as a consequence of the ever-changing face of New York City. My series Queen Surface reflects on my own photographic interests and photographing moments before they disappear. My background, I have a master's in fine arts from the School of Visual Arts in photography and related media. Currently, I'm a professor of photography at Hostos Community College a CUNY school in the South Bronx. My name is Ann Kafta. I am a visual artist who primarily uses textiles. Studios here in Brooklyn. I spend a good deal of time walking around Brooklyn and Queens, and there's something I find very grounding about the structures throughout the city.
I'm exploring ways to capture the city the way that I see it. Uh, the energy, the diversity, the changing color of the sky at dusk or later, later in the evening. sewing is what really gives it a texture and a dimensionality. You don't necessarily see all the quilting till you look on the back. This is the direction my work is heading in right now on some of these larger cityscapes. I'm Violet Baxter. My work starts pretty much with drawings. When I first moved to my studio, uh, it was at the very beginning of the, the change of uh, Long Island City. Uh, and I was awed when I first got there by all the sky. Um, now we have in this drawing, uh, which is a basis for most of my work, I, I generally uh, work from my drawings that are done from life. And we have here the beginnings of struck the cranes and the first new building that has gone up. So this has been a basis of a lot of my work. It's gone down to, um, this is pretty much the kind of life and kind of openness. There's that crane that's uh, also in the drawing. And it was more of a peaceful look then. Um, the buildings ac ac across the street uh, from my studio uh, were this color and they started to renovate that uh, this building right next to this one. Uh, so that's the beginning of the renovations of the school across the street, the Mason Tenders School. And the bridge is covered in um, protective bunting, uh, because that was also being renovated. And that building, uh, this is a close-up of that kind of construction. As you see, I'm very attracted to light and using light as color.
this is the finished building and the finished painting. And uh, down the block a little bit more is another building that is now also, that sky is covered in high buildings. Now I have moved my studio to Manhattan uh, where I live and my new studio now is still being set up to work in. So that's the whole new villa. Thank you for tuning into Access Studio today. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that you'll tune in next time. If you wish to purchase any of the artwork in this episode, please see the closing credits for the artist's emails. You can also check out past episodes of Access Studio on the YouTube channel, where you can leave a comment for the artist, and please consider subscribing to the channel.